Hey everybody, this is Perch. I'm here with Kari Andrews. Hello. How hey Perch, you? how's it going? <laughs> it's, it's going great. Thanks for agreeing to talk. And, and um, I, I mean, I should say on the offset, I've been a big fan of your work for quite some time uh, because you're so distinctive of an artist and a writer and, and kind of all these people. I got a million questions for you. But first things first, you have a new book coming out this week. I do. This book is a brand new book from AWA. That's uh, Artists, Writers, Artisans, I, be I believe. <laughs> Yes. Uh, not the American Wrestling Association. <laughs> and it is uh, called Erratic, E hyphen Radic. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a new, it's a crazy new book for a crazy new company. And, you know, I'm j I just want people to be aware that it's out there. I know we've got, you know, the, the crazy of the world, lockdowns, whatever. But this is, a, you know, this is a, this is a ho hopefully a fun little break from all the insanity. I think it's a great book and, and we'll get to that, but it's um, so artist writers and artist writers and artisans, the name doesn't roll off the tongue, but it's a, it's a, it's a unique. AWA, AWA is not too bad. AWA. I, I am like, I, I think of the wrestling federation from back in the day. Uh, they launched this year and I think probably had, I mean, they've been planning and planning and planning. And I think it was the worst luck in, in many ways. They, they launched with a comic that was kind of really about a pandemic and then the pandemic hit like simultaneously. So it is, but the, the quality is is really strong. I've noticed of a lot of these books. Well, that, that that's all due credit to Axel Alonso, mm -hmm. who was probably you know he's one of the my favorite editors I've ever worked with because he's got a real. He doesn't come from a he comes from a journalist background. He I think he has a journalism degree, yeah. and so he comes a little he comes a little out of left field for the world of comic books. But he still is a comic book fan. But I don't think he grew up a comic book fan. I think he found them later in life. Yeah. So I think his tastes are naturally drawn to, um, I, I don't know, uh, maybe, 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 maybe a, a, a quality and, and it's, it's less of a keech. It's less of a, like, sometimes I love comics because they remind me of being a kid, like certain, certain books, certain creators. But with Axel, I think it's like, he came at it as an, you know, I mean, I think in his twenties or whatever. So mm -hmm. it's, it's like an older and uh, taste and sensibility that, that I think he, enjoys uh, that kind of work in it and, and, and therefore enjoys working with people that, that create that kind of comic. If that makes, if that makes sense. No, it does. I, I think he, he has, a, he comes across a guy with a strategy and I think sometimes people are in it. Um, it comes across like they're in it for the love of the business, which is fine. Uh, but he comes across it like he, he actually has a strategy he's trying to follow and execute on and, and he wants to make business. And uh, it's, 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 it's interesting because he was so attached to Marvel and I think he had that uh, this kind of um, I don't know persona that was very very connected to that company. But then since he's come to AWA, I, I, as I mentioned, the, the quality has been really high. I just don't know that a lot of people have seen it yet. But now hopefully that's changing. Yeah, the books the books are all getting really good a good response from Year Zero to Resistance to mm -hmm. um, you know the, uh, whatever. They're, they're, the, it's it's not you know what reminds me it reminds me of when Warren Simmons went to Valiant and started bringing over like Jeff Lemire and things like that. And yeah. it's not, it's no coincidence that Warren was Axel's right-hand man for many years. So they have that shared sense of like, you know, these are, these are the kind of books, these are the kind of quality we want to make. And we'll bring, we'll bring those people with us when we do something else. Yeah. Uh, well, and it, so the quality of the show, I think if, if people haven't seen it, we will, well, I'll, I'm going to do some other videos and topics to kind of reintroduce people to the company because it, it did have bad timing, but you had done a lot of work for Marvel for years. And then this is kind of a, a big launch with AWA. How, how did, how did they find you? How did you come into this? Well, I'm still working with Marvel. I'm actually um, doing a new project with them as well that will come out cool. later next year. But what really happened was um, when Axel left Marvel, I just was like, "Hey, man, what, whatever you, whatever you're doing next, count me in." And uh, and it was as simple as that, really. Uh, he had a new a new publisher and he a new public he made a new company and invited me along to to jump in and pitch in. And I thought it would be fun to both work with an old friend, but also work in a new environment. So it was a and create new. I love creating new things. So it was an opportunity to create a new character. Uh, is it just a lot of a lot of up the situation was a lot of up it's it's a good um well actually i should say this first so i've been i would say negative over the last two years about this practice of of the uh the penciler also doing the inking and, and being forced into that situation where maybe the penciler doesn't want to do that 
but you're you're really the exception the, your exception to that rule you do and I, i've seen some other interviews of you 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 are writing it you're 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 doing all the art yourself and the in quality is is really high it looks like this is what you want to do what i mean it, it fits how you, you've, you've given some comments in the past about doing it all and, and just wanting to be in complete control of creative vision um how does that how'd you come to that how does that how'd that work for you well, let me just first say that I am, I am working with a colorist on this on this book, yeah, uh, yes, Brian Reber, who's doing a, an amazing job. Uh, he's, he's, I've known him for a long time, but this is actually I think this is the first time we've only ever worked together. But I've always just I've always just liked to do different things. Um, so when I first started at Marvel, I wanted to write right away. Mm -hmm. I wanted my favorite comic creators were always the writer artists like McFarlane or Howard Chaikin or Frank Miller or. Jim Starenko or, you know, whoever, those, those were the guys I liked. And I think there's just a different quality of work when a, the person who draws the story is also the person who tells the story. Uh -huh. And I think it's easy to see why, because when you work with a writer, um, th that person is writing a story in their imagination, putting it on words. And then as an artist, you're taking the words, putting it as pictures and then giving it back to a writer. So it's like a, and then he rescripts it based on the art often. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a coming and going. And it's, I think each, each creator then is re-clarifying what the other person is doing <laughs> in, in a right. way, like someone else is taking a pass at your work. Um, but when you're writing and drawing yourself, the inherent non-separation of those tasks, I think can create a, a more, um, uh, 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 base experience in, in terms of I'm not, I don't have to clarify for the artist exactly what I want. And if I'm the artist, I don't have to re clarify exactly what I'm hearing back to the writer. So I often, I often think there's a bit of, you can get a bit of a dreamlike sensation from a writer artist. Often, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not, but that's often what happens. Like one of my favorite yeah. Frank Miller books, um, I, the name always jumbles in my head, the, the hardcover electric book. Hmm, um, yeah the hardcover European format electric book. It's very dreamlike and it's hard to tell when you read that story, Electra comes back to life, but did she come back to life and you're in Matt Murdock's head, but is he really fighting evil uh, ninja ghosts or is he not? Like it's, it's a very dreamlike sensation. And, and I, I just, I, I got the same thing with Jim Starenko and Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. There's these early issues where it's hard to tell. They're so out there. It's hard, but they're so dramatic. It's hard to tell if this is really what's happening or if there's some dreamlike plot that's going along and you're, you're kind of, it's like in a David Lynch movie or something like that. Yeah. So it's just, I think it's a different experience. And I tell this story a lot. Like when you're part of a six man team assembling and you're making mattresses, well, if one of you wants to try making a toaster, it's very hard to try to convince five other people to like get the parts. Well, first convince them we want to do it and then can, you know, everyone has to get on board and okay, we're going to get all the different parts and we're going to assemble them in a certain way. And then we're going to, you know, and then the maybe it's months before you actually end up with a toaster. If five other people even want to make a toaster, right? But if you're doing all the parts yourself and you want to make a toaster, well, you just make a toaster and you make it like that day. Like there's no, <laughs> there's no, there's no yeah. resistance. The resistance is only in your own capabilities. So that, I think that there's, and there's strengths and minuses to that situation. Sure, but but uh, I it's something I love, and I love I love the results of of that kind of creating. I think. Yeah, I mean it's it's a difference between a a creating by committee, of which we're hearing a lot about in comics right now. There's this uh, this other kind of world where you see, uh, you know, like the X office is working in a committee type format, and and you have more of that kind of environment. But I think there's room for what you're doing here, where it does seem like a very pure kind of creative vision. Uh, yeah, here's, here's, a, here's a question for you, Perch. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you can think back in, in your love of not just comic books, but say any art, any art form in, alive, what's been the most amazing committee that's made art? Oh, yeah, I, it's, it, it doesn't happen. I mean, it's... <laughs> like, yeah. like, committees make roads, you know? Exactly. Committees make exactly. rules. Committees make large, you know, they make armies. <laughs> yeah. so committees, are for uh, committees are for structure. They're not for creative visions. And I think if, yeah. uh, I mean, is uh, some of the, you mentioned a bunch of creators as well, but John Byrne, when he took over Fantastic Four had this very long run, 
uh, was celebrated and, and there were good issues and bad issues in there, but it was one person kind of doing a lot of work. And I'm, I'm, I'm skating over and in this case, an inker and a colorist and other people on the team, but it was kind of one solid vision of story and art together. And uh, yeah. I love to do new things. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, if you go through all, all history, like your favorite, you know, the most famous artists of all time, Michelangelo, Shakespeare, Leonardo da Vinci, whatever, all the Ninja Turtles, like it's, <laughs> it's never like, it's never like, oh, the church was the greatest artist of all time. Right. Right. Well, the church contracted Michelangelo to, you know, do his, his paintings in celebration mm -hmm. of that uh, yeah. religion of, of the time. But, but uh, I think it's, I think an artist needs an organization because an artist by definition is usually unorganized because mm -hmm. when you're, when you're touched, when you, the more creative you are, the less structure you have inherently, usually sure in terms of personality testing or whatever. So like, I think a creative person needs that structure and they need a good editor. But mm -hmm. they don't. I don't think. A, I don't think artists do well with committees. Like I've never. I've always just jumped out of the out of the committee world. Now, having said that, I, I do also do some directing, and mm -hmm. television directing is very much a committee based art making um, ploy. But it's almost once you get into the, it, we, maybe we, someday we could have a discussion about that. But it's that's that's a lot of times it's a it's a it is a ploy. It's a lot. It's like not really it's a bunch of people trying to pretend it's one thing and that's actually something entirely, entirely different. And you can either get, and if you're a real artist, you can like find ways to just see through the veil of the, of committees and people and structure and, you know, just still make art. Yeah. It's, it's a different world. I mean, um, I mean, one of the magical parts about comics is that you can put these things together as a small, as a small group or as a singular vision. Whereas when you start to get into movies and it is a good segue into asking you a little bit about that. I mean, there are a lot more moving parts. There's a lot more mechanics. There's a lot more to it. It doesn't quite work quite the same way, but what a lot of people may not realize is that you are a, you're a very accomplished director. I mean, you've, you've produced films, you've, you've won awards, you, you've, you're, you're, that's a big part of your life in addition to the comic work. Yeah, it's it's like my my other side of my it's my the yin to my yang. So it doesn't really have much to do with comics, but it is a career I built up separately and concurrently while doing comic books. So it's always interesting. Like whenever I do, whenever I direct film, people are always like, "Oh, I can really see your comic book background." And then whenever whenever I do comic books, people can I often hear, "Oh, I can really see your filmmaking background." Like, but they're they're real. It's really again, it's just a. Um, I don't think it's true. I think it's just I think it's just how people are reframing the same art in two different mediums. So <laughs> you know, I don't know. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's fun. It's fun. The, the, the difference is when you direct a movie um, or a TV show, show, you're working with 100 people at a time every day. And, and uh, sometimes the, the gridlock that happens, it's just like you just wish you could be alone just doing everything yourself. And when you're doing comic books, you are alone doing everything yourself. And sometimes you, you get a little lonely and you wish you could work with other people. Like it's fun to work with talented, yeah, uh, talented cinematographer, talented actors and talented, you know, production designers. Like it's fun to collaborate as well as to, to, uh, yeah, to work on your own. They, they, so I call the yin my yang, the yin and the yang. Like I like both and both should be like the true symbol of the yin and yang is one that's in motion. That's why they're little. Right shapes not not just blocks mm -hmm. so it's a wheel and in each wheel is a bit of the other so i like to jump back and forth it's uh no i mean it, i do think it comes across your work and uh, i'm looking down at, at your book uh, so back to erratic for a second so first off if somebody's coming into this fresh and i, I would assume many people uh, at this point awa is still trying to gather an audience get people who really understand that company it is it is a connected universe but not a aggressively connected universe. Is that fair to say? Well, there's two, two separate parts of AWA. One is there is a shared universe of AWA, and that is based on the Straczynski setup of a pandemic that erupts into superpowers for a select few. And then there's also a creator-owned uh, part of the, that company as well. And they those parts don't interact, but the shared universe does interact. So my book, Erratic, does connect to the universe of resistance mm -hmm. but it is not um it doesn't uh the, the stories don't cross over it's its own book it's its own thing it's its own but it but it supplements like you can reach you can each read you can read each each on an own there's no reference to the other but 
other than you know it's like old it's like it's like old marvel books before they started crossing over <laughs> it's the same yeah. world, different characters different storylines it's set in that world but it, it it isn't if you are not reading any of those other books if you're coming into this thing clean you're not going to be confused uh, you, won't, gonna, you won't miss a thing no you won't miss a thing at all um so it's set in this is it in this in this world and i what what strikes out so five issues it's a limited series and um i'll ask you at the end if there's plans to do more than that but what what struck me here is that there's a a lot of of really strong characters and personalities that come out of this i mean like all the characters have a unique personality all the characters are really there's there's you get the sense there's backstory you develop for like everybody it, it is a very defined world with all these characters um what what made you want to set and it's it's set in a in a high school um what made you want to do a comic in that world well i I one my favorite character growing up was Spider Man, that kind yeah. of teenage that kind of teenage superhero, and I always, you know, I fell in love with that character when I was a little kid, and that love of that character has survived to now. So there's very few characters that are created in that teenage space, but I think it's a space that um, has so much potential for for mm -hmm. archetypal storytelling because it's the space that ex exists when a boy becomes a man and that and that's such a superhero such a superhero space like such an archetypal yeah, space for sure. like if you look at superheroes as like the narrative that maybe that maybe forps your or forps <laughs> shapes forms and shapes forms and shapes your um your journey is into manhood like that's that's the direct uh adventure right right there but it's also yeah. like we've all been to high school or if you're a kid you're going to go to high school and that little world of high school is such a it's always such a representation of the greater world around us and and what i found interesting about that world in today was that world is so different than what we remember it oh yeah like, yeah like you know i was watching a, a pink floyd music video uh, another brick on the wall and in that music video it's like this old english school teacher wrapping the hands right. of a young i don't know nine-year-old boy who's writing poetry I'm like you should not be writing poetry Psh! and then he's like they get sent to this conveyor belt in the, in, the, in the desk to become these faceless things that then go into the meat meat grinder mm -hmm. and it's such a quaint idea like that does not exist anymore like that's not how school i have kids like my kids are not told they can't write poetry anymore my kids are told they must write poetry yeah now. it's cool it's 180 degrees opposite yeah yeah but i don't see that i don't see that in pop culture like being like people are people haven't it hasn't made its way up the chain of of sh even in even in current teenage shows i have not seen that um, sure. examined. <laughs> I haven't either. It is, I've got two children, uh, as well. And, and they are, uh, you know, it, there, there is not this authoritarian, uh, you know, making robot kind of classroom setting that you still see on TV. I mean, they're still going back to that in movies and shows and cartoons. You still have that perception of the, the angry school teacher who's, who's like the Pink Floyd video. That that's a great, that's a great analogy, but that that's not what it's like. No, no, it's not like that at all. But I do, I do, th I do think, I do think in many ways, it's still the same thing and that there can be a school experience that is very negative and does, does try to form you into a kind of like opinionless, uh, 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 per persona less, uh, you know, widget, but yeah. it's just that the kind of widget they're making is, is is flipped from the kind of midget, widget they used to be making. So I think it's, I just think it's, I'm just poking fun of it. I, mean, I don't really have anything great to say about it or grand to say about it, but other than to acknowledge it's there. And I haven't seen anyone else do that before. So that was, that was, no, that was I think fun. I haven't either. And it, that's, that's what struck me about the book because on, on one hand you, you are, I, there is, you do get a Spider-Man feel at the beginning of just, there's a superhero. There's a, there's a, there's a kid, he's becoming a man. It, it, it has that, that feel to it in many ways, but then, you flip the script and we get into these classroom settings and it is, <laughs> it is very, they're, they're very enjoyable. You got like four pages here, five pages of, of really enjoyable classroom experience that I haven't seen anywhere before. It's just, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just fun. But here's what I, here, here's what I also like about the book is I like, um, I think we were talking earlier. We were talking earlier before the, we started talking, talking maybe, um, that there is a reintroduction of a cost to finding out if you're really a superhero 
And in today's world, no, none of our superheroes, there's no cost. Like, why would anyone care if Peter Parker was Spider-Man? In fact, you would, if you were Peter Parker in today's world, you would want to be Spider-Man because you would want to be celebrated and there's no cost. You would get rich. If you, you know, if a supervillain came to attack you, well, you would have the Avengers at your side. Like there's no cost. There's zero cost for being a superhero in today's world. And I think it's this, I think it's the infection of social media for sure. And that we want to celebrate ourselves and we don't want to celebrate the things we do anymore. We just want to like, here's what I had for breakfast. Like, like retweet, you yeah. know, um, yeah. Spider-Man would be doing it for the Instagram likes at this yeah, point. Even in a good way, even in an altruistic way, even in a Dwayne Johnson, the rock way, like, you know, he would want to be like, get up and vote kids. Here's, here's Peter Parker, also known as Spider-Man telling you to vote, you know, it's like, but, yeah. but I like that there's a cost to, revealing what you can do, especially if what you can do is amazing. Like, I think that's, to me, that's part of the fun of the superheroes is I, like, what's the cost if Clark Kent is discovered as Superman? What's the cost if Peter Parker is discovered as Spider-Man? And is that cost high? I hope it is because then I'm really going to enjoy why he doesn't tell everyone who he is, you know? Like, I, 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 I so I like that the world that Trzynski set up uh, inherently has a cost. Yeah. No, it, it, it is. And, and not to, to give away the book, but you do get the feeling, I don't, I don't know where you're going past issue one, but it, you do get the feeling that cost is going to hit the character in a pretty major way. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 no spoilers, but it definitely feels like it. Um, no, I, I like that. I like that dynamic because the, the, the superheroes, and I think you're articulating something I've struggled and failed to articulate is there isn't, there aren't stakes. There aren't real mm -hmm consequences and and they do things i mean superman has actually had a secret identity revealed it had it back revealed it again over the course of i think four years it's flipped twice and it just doesn't really feel like it it matters anymore uh these this this whole it, it feels subtractive it feels like there's this whole world that was taken away of interesting stories and dynamics and, and things you could learn about the character and the struggles that they go through are kind of off the table now and the more you deconstruct the secret identity and the, and the hero, the less there is to tell. It's, I think I think a lot of people think they're adding to the mix, but it feels more like they're subtracting. Which you can yeah, there was a time. You know what it's like. It's like that old. I don't know if you remember this old sitcom, Moonlighting, with Bruce oh, sure. and Sybil, she Sybil Shepherd. Anyway, yeah. the show was like a hit show. Everyone loved it, and it was always like, well, we think they're in love with each other, but they'll never. And we think they're going to get together. I think same thing with. Um, there was another show. Another. <laughs> where it's like, will they, won't they? Right, will they, won't they, will they, won't they, will they, won't they? Well, the moment you answer that question, the show ends. Yeah. <laughs> there's no, there's right. no, the moment you, you know, I was, we were rewatching Dexter, me and my wife, which was uh, a yeah. great show until the last couple seasons. And why? Well, because his yeah. sister decided he was in love with him and found out he was the killer. Like, like, it seems like, it seems <laughs> like, I think at the time, it can seem like, well, that's something we will never do. That's why we have to do it. We're going to shake things up and flip them on their head. And it's like, you can do that. But if you do do that, be okay that the show's over. Like, you know, it's, like yeah. it's like, there are some questions where the, the, the stakes, once you remove those stakes by betraying those stakes, well, are there enough stakes left to keep going? And I think in super comics, there's been, a, you know, enough stakes where you can keep it going, but inherently if i think of the archetype of superman it's the superman clark kent dynamic and if i think of the archetype of spider-man it's the spider-man peter parker dynamic like there's a reason why they're different people when they put on the masks or put on the cape and it's not because people want to draw different to people or just like costumes i think there's a fundamental archetypal reason why we separate the person from what from the accomplishment right i think it's like that needs to play out in a narrative structure and then if you present truth in a new unique way people will orientate towards it and that's what I think people love about those stories. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. There's something there that, uh, that I've been, yeah. it's danced around in my head a lot too. And I haven't quite got it down, but it's something like that. I think it, it's, it's popular to want to subvert expectations and let's, let's give people what they're not expecting because a lot of people are expecting kind of the story will continue forever indefinitely with this yeah. status. Quo. But I think what people forget is a lot of the audience signs up for that journey. They sign up to have this indefinite, conflict and struggle. They don't sign up for it to end. And so the second you start subverting the expectations, like you said, you're, you're coming to the end. You've introduced your conclusion. Yeah, totally. So, totally. 
You know, I mean, again, if you want to, it's like uh, Friends, uh, the show, they, there was this Ross, Rachel, will they get together? Right. Well, right. They get together, the ratings start to tank and they're like, oh, let's unwind this somehow. Let's, let's kind of reset, but it never, you, you can't put the genie back in the bottle at that point. And it just, yeah. Dexter is a good example because I guess we're getting another season of that now. And Well, and then you know. if you read, here's what's interesting. If you read the press release, the showrunner of that, of that final season, the bonus season, is he says explicitly that they're going to fix all that all that went wrong in that last season. <laughs> like they're aware. I don't know if they're aware of what exactly went wrong, but they're aware that something went wrong, and so there's going to be some kind of restructuring that happens. And that and that and that. Yeah. But uh, I don't. But here's here's where I lose all your all your viewers. Perch, <laughs> I have this strange idea. That like if you listen to a hit song, right? A hit song. It's like why is it, why there's so much noise. People make so much stuff. People make so many comics. People make so much music. Once something pops up and people turn, everyone turns towards it. Like that's a hit. Everyone loves it. Why? Why is that? Because if if someone else did a sound alike song of that of that same song that sounded the same, same chord structure, whatever, same music, maybe even the voice is the, is similar. But people will have an adverse reaction. They'll be like, oh, that's a copy of that right. thing I liked. Like, what is that? Well, if you chase the result of something, yeah, it's it's different than than in living a thing or embodying a thing. And what is that thing? Well, it's gotta be a surprise, right? It's gotta be something new. What's new? And it's gotta be true, right? It's gotta, it's gotta live. And what is truth? I don't know, but it's we we know it. We all recognize it. So it has to be new and true. And I think if you're just trying to subvert. That's only the that's only the the new, but it's if you subvert the underlying thing that makes the show work, you're destroying the truth. So then you've destroyed the show. That's my that's my that's my idea. I, I think no, I, I I bet most of the viewers are going to agree with you. I think that is true. I think we see a lot. Of, I think there's this. Um, I, I think people come in and they they want to make their mark on something really quick, yeah. and and so they they don't want to have the patience of a you know, Claremont 15 plus year run, they want to be in it done in, in, in a year or less. And, and there's other, I mean, maybe the company only contracted them for six issues too. I mean, if you, if you're giving somebody a tiny leash, then of course they're going to try and get something done in, in six issues. But those shortcuts um, tend to be more destructive than additive uh, because you are just trying to get something done in a short period of time. And yeah. What can you do? Uh, well, creation, I mean, creation is a destructive force. Like, sure, you know, fire both burns and creates, right? It's both the light and the and and the thing that you know, it's the death, and then the ashes become fertile. Like, it's it's fire is the in the yin yeah. and the yang. That is the you know the chaos that created the creation force. So there is there is like any time. Like I've had this urge lots. Like you get an urge, you you jump on a project and you want to just mess it up. Like there's <laughs> a real urge, and you want to mess it up. And I think that's a good urge and a healthy urge if you can orientate that chaos towards truth right so, yeah. so if you can under try to understand the core of that this is what i always try to do when i jump on a project not always successfully but if i'm jumping on a spider-man book like with spider-man rain or whatever yeah uh, uh highly highly controversial book even to this day, <laughs> well, years well, years well, years. it consistently shows up as one of the top five to 10 stories ever told to spider-man oh God, I, I i i see new articles about spider-man rain like every couple months yeah. Like literally I could pull one up. I just saw one the other day, but I'm very interested in that Spider-Man story of like with great power comes great responsibility. There's the truth of the character. So every story must underline, re-examine, retell, uh, re-examine that, that fundamental truth about Spider-Man, the destruction, like in, in my version of rain, I, I killed Mary Jane, but I tried to do it in a way that reinforced the tr underlying truth of the character. Right. In a way that like, that was both new and shocking because I had that creative urge to destroy things <laughs> for right. better or for worse. But I tried to, I tried to do it in a way that reinforced that character, not subverted him. I didn't turn him into a serial killer from the future who was hunting other Spider-Men throughout time or something like that. You know? bad, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's not bad to subvert expectations and come to an end because things do sometimes need to end. It's not like, you know, that, that endings are necessarily bad. It just, you, in theory, you would like to plan for that ending, not accidentally fall into yeah. it. Well, but you know, if you have an ending, I mean, uh, our favorite arcs are redemption arcs, right? Uh, the rebirth, the cycle, right. the Phoenix, like you would accidentally end Dexter. Uh, you can rebirth that show either with new actors, the same actors, it was all a dream as they did in Dallas, whatever, that's the cheap yeah. way to do it. But 
you know, superhero comics, the thing about, I love the superhero comics, is you're constantly reinventing these characters. Every time you have a new core creative team, and you never know what team is going to do it because everyone takes their swing at the characters. But Frank Miller reinvented Batman. You know, yeah. John Byrne reinvented Superman. Todd McFarlane reinvented Spider-Man. It, it happens. It's not, everyone tries to do it. Not everyone succeeds, but it's when it does work. That reinvention is what make is what gives it life, you know, not just like the same, like here's here's another thing. Like, what's the worst thing you can say about someone's art making, a writer or an artist? Oh, they're hacking it out. They're just doing the same thing. Like you yeah. need novelty to True. to make it real, to make it to make it worth you, it needs to be new to make it worth it, uh, living out, but that but you need to make it true and real in a new way, and it needs to it needs to work together in, in, a, in an interesting way. I mean, there, there's a lot of contradictions I think in comics, and especially where for the readers. I mean, readers want what they want; they want these stories that they remember, and they'd like those to continue forever. At the same time, they'll be very quick to say, "This is repetitive. I've read this before. Why can't we get something new?" And then, then the next breath, we'll say something like, "Well, this is too new. This was <laughs> you changed." Yeah. Too much. It's a hard thing to navigate. I, I don't. I don't think any of this is easy. Isn't it interesting that the that the at a time when there's never been less separation between the creators and the audience, there's never been more division or a feeling of division between the audience and the creators. That's very true. And I, th- I just blame social media. Like I just don't want to see how Harry Houdini does his magic. Like I just want to see the illusion. And go along for the ride, and I don't want to see what he eats for breakfast. Like I don't know, you know. Like I don't know. I think it. I think that's. Part, I think that's part of the problem is that separation between a private and a public space. And I don't know how to fix it because in today's comic book world, you're kind of expected to market your books as a creator through social media. So it's like a weird. It's a weird conundrum. And then the more you interact with social media, the more you engage social media, the thinner the walls between the quote unquote audience and the quote unquote creators. And then maybe because the walls are so thin that there's they feel so much further apart because you can like look at people through this big plexiglass barrier, but you can't actually engage with you with each other. Whereas before, maybe you'd be in different cities and you wouldn't, you know, you would see you'd kind of get a sense of what the audience felt and you get a sense of what the creators were up to, but but you would engage with the material, not the not the not the person. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that in the past you'd you'd have people go to cons, they get to meet. A creator and it would be in a very set environment you're kind of know what you're there for and everybody's coming to the table with the same goals in mind i mean social media is a, is a challenge because on one hand yeah everybody should be free to go on that thing and do whatever they want and talk about what they're eating or some frustration they had or whatever they can talk about it's their their social media feed they can do whatever they want but when you're somebody who fans are coming to see customers are coming to see they come with a certain level of expectation when you don't meet that expectation that's going to create conflict fair or unfair it just will Mm-hmm. And then when on top of that, you, you throw in kind of the, uh, the frustration that people get with each other and the, the idea of uh, it just it, all the things are wrong or to to prevent meaningful con, uh, conversation. And it it is it's, it's like you say, it is a group is a situation where people are uh, they're closer than they've ever been before and yet much further apart than they are. with the algorithms aggravating up any kind of conflict, right? Like, so any, any kind of conflict between anyone gets algorithmed up the chain of like what you see first in your feeds. Uh, so sure. if, if you're engaging with creators or the audience or whoever, quote unquote, that you'll be more, I mean, you know, we're attuned to, we, we, we naturally as people direct towards conflict as a safety mechanism, but you know, that w- when you have the social media companies replicating that instinct and enhancing that instinct just to get eyes on their product, it's just so destructive. So, I hate social media. It's so destructive. I hate it. I am, I'm with you. I'd love. I'd love for that to burn down. Um, while we're while we're while we're engaged in, in social media right now at the moment. Well, for sure. I, I it is. It is <laughs> I think it's worth why though. I mean, I and I've always said when I do a, a video where I'm I'm critical about something, my, the, the worst reaction that or the reaction I do not want to see, but I get is is the person going, "Yeah, you tell them, screw those companies." I was like, "That's not the reaction I was going. For. <laughs> not what I want." But it is, it's, it's inevitable. I mean, that's, that's what you're going to get. It's also better than no reaction. Like even in any art making, you always know the worst reaction is no reaction. Like, you know, that's that's true. You throw the stone Uh, and there's no ripple. Like, you know, you know, I don't know. How, you know, you made a comment one. I'm curious about this and and what you could say. I don't want to get you into trouble with this question, uh, but um, I I'm, I'm puzzled by the promotion because you made a comment that, you know, creators are kind of in, uh, 
they're pushed to promote their own work. There, there's a, and, and it's for your own success, I think, in, in getting a book out there. And, and I noticed that a lot of creators uh, using it, Matt Rosenberg, for example, he'll do a book. And then he goes on Twitter and he aggressively promotes that book. And it's nice that he does. I mean, other shop owners can see that and say, okay, I see this book. But does that create, what kind of, it's, it feels like that creates a no-win situation in some cases for the creators because the publisher is not necessarily promoting the book. The creator is, and I'm, I'm saying that wrong. The publisher does do promotion. But when the creator has to do it themselves, aren't they walking like an incredible tight rope there of what they can say, what they can't say? what they're supposed to do. I mean, it, it feels like a, a bad situation for a creator or am I, do I have that wrong? Well, in the, in the height of X-Men, John Byrne, Chris Claremont, X-Men, would you really want John Byrne on Twitter engaging with the audience and selling the book? He would not. <laughs> like I, you know, there's a fire that burns in the belly of some of the, the best artists that sure. fire is strange and it doesn't make sense. And often it makes these people are horrible. I'm not saying John Byrne. I don't know John Byrne at all, but so other, other artists and in, in yeah, the reputation, world. let's just say, <laughs> yeah, that, you know, a lot, a lot of, of crazy artists, but it's that crazy that, that, that is the engine that makes their art that, that you may love. Like sure. there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, real jerky rock stars, but, but sure. hopefully you never know it because you can really enjoy what they do. Um, yeah. There's the, the reason, listen, a politician, is able to create a facade of friendliness that everyone likes, but he's actually an empty vessel. Uh, as you see in the, what's the greatest politician? Well, someone who has nothing to say, but everyone wants to hear it. Right. And right. then, and then the greatest artist is something who has something important to say, and you can't help but hear it. And those are not the same people, but somehow social media, you have to be the same person. And the biggest problem, the biggest problem is, is just economics. Like these companies just don't have marketing teams anymore. Right. So, so you're going to rely on your creators who have a hundred thousand or five or even 5,000 followers to, are you going to want to, you're going to want to, I don't think you should, I think, you, but you're going to want to, you're going to ask, I guess, ask my friends get asked all the time. I, you know, I was always kind of avoiding that. And I took a step towards it with iron fist. I thought, Oh, with iron fist, I'm writing and drawing it. I'm really going to take a step. I'm really going to finally join Twitter and I'm really going to step it up and I'm going to try to push it in a way. I see other people do it. And I really did. And I really didn't see any results. Like, I don't think it actually works. I think it can work, but I don't think inher it inherently works. The only thing that you're really doing as a creator by building up a fan base, I think, is setting up your uh, Indiegogo or right. your Kickstarter. That's the real power for a creator. Like, you set up that email list or whatever, those eyes, because you, you won't have access to the marketing machine, even if it's only three people at a, a, a you know middle tier company so that that's that's the true benefit of doing it as a creator but i think it's actually you will get a you won't get the result you're looking for if you're a company and you're relying on your creators to be your marketing team like you inherently won't do it you'll have the occasional creator that can dance that line like a like a todd mcfarlane or, or whatever but then he's going to dance his line all over to his own company and then right. you'll have maybe another creator who is a little bit more infamous or whatever that that ruffles feathers and does get the eyeball but maybe not in the way that you even want like i don't know and then you'll get a lot of people who try to make noise but can't and then they'll feel awful about themselves and do bad work <laughs> no, 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 you know it feels all negative i i think that there's there's very little for the business as a whole uh, it, there's certain certainly people i think who can uh benefit from it and i do think it, it does build your mailing list for your kickstarter your indiegogo or whatever else absolutely that's true but if you're Marvel and your plan is that you're going to leverage the creators larger than life personas on social media to market your books, I think you're, I, I think you're playing with fire. <laughs> I think it's, it's going to be less successful than more successful over time. Uh, I just, it, yeah. And I, I think it's bad for the creators. It, it, it's, it sets them up in a case where if they cross some very weird line that they may not know exists, suddenly they can be on the outs with the, an editor at a company and they were just trying to get out there and promote their book, but they they don't have a marketing background. They don't necessarily have a promotion background. They're doing maybe the best they can, and yet they're they're held to this standard that that feels unfair. Yeah, it can. I think it can be. It can it, at the very at, at a minimum. I don't think it's as helpful as people would like to believe it is. Yeah. And if you're a bigger company like Marvel or DC, there's actually much less less pressure to do any of that. Like I've never been asked by Marvel or DC to like go tell everyone. Well, maybe I mean a tiny bit, but not really. 
but every other company I've worked with, especially we do my own image book, like, well, then there is, but there's just no, you know, on you. yeah. you're on your own there, my friend, like you are on your own. Like uh, everything's yeah. different. Then at, and if you're on your, if you're on your own com- so too much, well, now you would just be do a creator. Own, you should just be doing a creator own book. If you can, if you can actually attract the eyeballs that maybe some companies think you can, why are you working for that company? Like, that's right. the that's the weird part of it of it all. But I don't. I think the answer is really uh, any company, no matter how small you are, just needs to be more more robust in in their marketing themselves. Yeah, I. I well, I, I absolutely agree with that. I've. <laughs> I've ranted on that many a time. Uh, I think it's it's so so critical. Um, so so back to erratic for a second. So so you've got five issues. Are you still in the process of of putting this together, or is the comic done at this point, or where are you? Yeah, well, I'm actually I'm drawing the cover for issue five right now, and I'm I'm on in finishing up interiors for four. So I'll be finished right. up, um, uh, you know, next month, I guess. Now I think I, I though I couldn't find where earlier today. Are you doing this all digitally from the beginning, or how are you putting it together? Yeah, I'm doing it all at all digitally. I, I I I jump back and forth between traditional and digital all the time in many different styles and many different ways, especially with covers. I like to uh, sometimes I'll do straight digital, sometimes I'll do painted, sometimes I'll do airbrush or sometimes acrylic, sometimes oil paint, sometimes even, sometimes even photography based, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, digital lets me move faster. And also with erratic, I'm experimenting with. I was trying to be new, so I'm experimenting with doing my backgrounds in a different way than I've done before. So that could only exist in, in a digital space. So I don't yeah. know. I mean, for me, it was like a big experiment. I don't know if the results are <laughs> are any different, really, ultimately. But but as an experiment, it was a. It looks great. Uh, I mean, the, the the title looks really really good. Um, it's on sale on Wednesday, I believe, in second Wednesday, December second. That's right. Um, where can you tease anything? Like, are, are, is there a series after this one, or do you know yet? Are you going to continue to work with AWA? Like, do, or do you, is that way too soon to get into that? I think it's too it's too it's too it's too soon it's too soon to get into it. I'm sure it, I'm sure it all depends on the. Uh, the whatever the sales meets the response meets the multimedia interest meets my my availability meets their calendar you know that it's the weird muck of it all like the part you know i committed to i committed to a five issue story and that's and that's what i'm doing and then we'll, we'll see what happens after that excellent well i i, I guess I'm, i've got a lot of questions about this character i can't ask yet because the comic isn't out and the, the five issues aren't out yet so i'm but i'm very curious i think you can ask you can ask oh, what i mean Spoilers! Spoilers! What? Here's here. Let me tell you what. Let me tell you the weird thing about they found with movie trailers. Why every time you see a movie trailer, you, you think oh, I just saw the whole film. Why would they do that? Well, because people actually want to see a story that they that they feel they already know. So, I, so the reason, right? The marketing reason why they show the whole movie now in the trailer is because it's more effective. And I don't think there's anything wrong with. I'll let you know. I'll hold myself back if there's any real spoilery stuff. But I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, spoiling some stuff. And uh, why not? Well, I guess I mean my big question. You, you've 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 put a lot of work into these. Like, there's a remarkable amount of of backstory and personality in these characters. Just I, I I read all the comics every week, and what really stands out about this is even the teachers, the mom, the various kind of supporting characters have a lot of definition to it. So I look at this and I go, there's a lot more work in here than five issues. Now, granted, a comic has to be successful and everything else, but I have to imagine the these characters are going to continue past the series. I mean, if, assuming you do, no, nobody's going to die at the end. <laughs> what, you're, what you're saying, Perch, is it's overwritten. No, no, not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's they flow alive. I, it's, it's, um, I want to actually mention this because I, I, we talked about high school and, and this characterization and everything else, but this isn't a YA book by any stretch of the imagination. This is very much no, a superhero. No, certain people that, certain people that, that I work with have latched on to the idea of it. Maybe it is a YA book. And I think are excited about that. Maybe it is a YA book because I think there is a, there is, I mean, no, I think there's the perception that YA books could be more popular, but I didn't write it as a YA book. It may be, you know, I think it could may, it could maybe uh, uh, overlap that space, but only in the way that the original Spider-Man series could yeah. overlap that space. It's just a straight up superhero tale with a teenage character. It is. I mean, the, the, the character is a young adult. 
I guess. It is not a yeah. young adult book. <laughs> but, yeah, that's right. that's right. Yeah. I mean, by that logic, though, we'd be saying that uh, almost all, many of the characters, Marvel and DC, were YA books, at least at some point. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've always hated that. I've always hated that distinction and definition because when I grew up reading comic books, they were intended to be for kids. But of course, um, they they transcended that in, in intention. And they some of the look at the Jim Stranko stuff. Some of the most adult storytelling in the, ever, ever happened in the '60s in Marvel. Like what? Sure. Um, but so, but that there was never like I don't know. When, as soon as you start, as soon as you start to, for marketing reasons, put a piece of art into a into a age group. Yeah, I, I think you're destroying that piece of art. You're destroying the potential of the piece of art. Like the greatest Walt Disney films were intended for everyone. So. Erratic is intended for everyone. It's like, I want a 50 year old man to be able to enjoy that book as much as a 10 year old mm -hmm. kid. And it's not, it's not all ages in a way that, that I think uh, makes it too sugary or saccharine. Like it's, it's like, uh, I don't know. In many ways, I think erratic is probably a bit, bit, bit transgressive. It's a bit, it's a bit, it throws a bit, it throws a couple bombs. Like <laughs> I, think, I think in a way that's, you know, uh, just fun for me to do as a, as a creator. Like, uh, it's, we'll I, I don't know. What, I have no, to be honest, I have no, I, this is nothing like what I've ever written, but yet it feels like some things I've written and it's, it's all feels new to me and I have no idea what, how anyone's going to respond to it. So I have no, I have, I'm just making it. No, I, 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 I think um, I'm reminded of a lot of things. I, so this may be some other odd analogy, but I, I, I of course read a lot of manga a lot of comics of everything and the characterization of the teachers and very distinctive personalities and friends and distinctive person, all those, it feels like the kind of care that you get from a one piece or a miter academia or a book like that, where every character that's going to show up on the page needs to matter. At least on some level, there are no background characters. Everybody's got to fit this world because they got to be described characters. And that's, that's why I took away. I, it's not overwritten at all. It's that every, the, you know, the people who are on the page matter. That's how it comes across. Oh, good, good. Yeah, I mean, I just you know, I just want to put, I just want to put this kid in a world, in a world that is a reflection of the world we live in today that I have not seen before. In a, in a like, there is a bit of a, I don't know if you want to call it a sting or a wink of truth in that yeah. world that he that he uh, finds himself in. That is, that is a, again, I think it's just the world we live in. But it's a, it's I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it really winked at by no. many people <laughs> you know, you know, i don't know if that makes sense make, read the book go find the book read the book and then and then uh uh it may make more sense to what i'm i'm talking in riddles but no i i people have to to check you can't out. talk about this stuff in anything but riddles unless you're a comedian and i'm not that funny so <laughs> can't i can't survive it perch it is, uh, it, it is a, it is a, it, I, I, again, I, I mean, I'm thinking of things like assassination classroom and some of those books is the closest analogy to where you have fully formed characters and situations. Um, there's a lot of people doing, uh, superhero books and, and in the whole YA genre that feel very paper thin. And, and I'm thinking back your, your analogy about the, uh, the Pink Floyd video, um, uh, brick in the wall. It is that same style of school you you're presenting an extremely different world it's very refreshing it's, it's nice. a new version it's a new version of that same style of school i actually had actually had uh axel axel said uh something to me he's like yeah someone someone at wba thinks like they're a little worried that all these teachers are are villains and uh <laughs> i was like go on <laughs> yeah man when you're in high school like what are you talking about? Like, of course, and it was, it was a friendly conversation. It's not, yeah. I mean, it was not an argument, but it was like, you know, the, that is, that was the intention that, 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 you know, these are, they're all, when you're a kid, all those grownups exerting various forms of educational and social control are villains to some extent. And you have to survive that cattle run and come out, like come out, you know, hopefully come out a stronger person, a better person, a, 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 you know, go in a boy, come out a man. Like that's, that's really what you want to do in high school. I don't know if you can do that anymore these days. I don't know if you can come out men. Like, can you come out a man in high school or, or now, now do you, now is that, is that Brazil. yeah for Bowden, you know, for college? No. Like, what is that, what is that ritual that used to be high school, you know, that used to be survived the beat down by the, by the kids? Yeah, it's, it's still it's still a brutal beatdown, 
now it's just in, in new ways, new and sad, more sadistic ways. Like, I don't know. I, I, that's, but I think find stuff fun. And I like to poke, I like to poke fun at, I like to poke fun at things. So. No, it's, it's fun. And it's, it's, I, I mean, there's a superhero book and this was true with Peter Parker back in the day. Oliver is our, our hero, our, our kid. He is fighting everything. He's fighting a parent situation. He's fighting a school situation, the teachers, and then giant, kind of, you know, disasters as a hero. And the, the, I don't know, the hook, the catch, he can fight for 10 minutes a day. Yeah. Oh yeah. This is what we talk about. So when I, yeah, I wanted to do a, I wanted to do an archetypal teenage kind of superhero character. And of course the most obvious archetype is Spider-Man. And again, that's one of my favorites. So that's just an archetype I lean into. So I knew I wanted to create that kind of an archetype archetype. Um, and I just kind of threw out there to the universe, like, I think to me anyways, creativity comes in just bursts of explosions and it, you have to, like, they don't come, it's not a steady stream. It's not a low frequency stream of like, pick, 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 pick. It's usually like, bang, write it down, bang, write it down, bang, write it down. And your job that you learn very quickly is you need to write it down immediately. And I usually do to my phone. But with this character, I knew I wanted this kind of a character. I wanted someone probably energy based i don't know something like animal inspired i wanted i wanted a suit someone could wear for halloween i wanted the symbol someone could wear for a t-shirt i wanted i just wanted that thing i just wanted something archetypal to just come to me and it just kind of like, bam it just hit me all at once like erratic he looks like a rat he has a tail he has his ears but he's kind of technology based but he doesn't have technology based powers and he has kind of energy powers and I've just been in so many situations throughout my life where my phone has been dying and it really creates a ticking clock of like, yeah. can I get to my car and put in my coordinates home? I have no idea how to get home from wherever I am or if I'm driving in LA or something, I have no idea where to get to my next thing, uh, but my phone is dying and this, that's pressure is so <laughs> weird and crazy. But I thought, well, what if that was your powers? What if your powers just had this like really bad um Mm -hmm. cell phone battery life of like 10 minutes. So you have 10 minutes to do your thing and you can do amazing things, but only for 10 minutes. And then you have to recharge your body for 24 hours. Yeah. Kind of be, it's like a um, capacitor. It's kind of like a, a, a storm cloud. Like the storm cloud will release the lightning only after a certain amount of electricity builds up in the, mm -hmm. well, now we're, now we're, now we're, now we're speaking beyond my level of, uh, of learning, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you need to build up enough energy to then release it. And I thought, oh, well, that's, that'd be fun. And then 50, it just came to me. It all came to me once. I just drew, I drew a cover. I came, I made the logo. I came up with my tagline all in an afternoon. And the tagline is 15 years old, 10 minutes to save the world and erratic. Um, you know, I, I think that's fun. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it before. I haven't seen Anytime you come up with an idea you really haven't seen before, it's like, well, that's something maybe you should do. Yeah. I, I, there's a lot of new in this book. I think uh, people should really like it. I, the biggest challenge is just in a world of everything shut down and, and marketing kind of hiccuping in different areas. I just uh, I want to make sure people find it. If they find it, I think they're going to really like it. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I do think that's the that is the that is the even without the shutdown. It, for a emerging comic publisher, that's always the biggest thing. It's like, how do people find you? And AWA is a brand new company, mm -hmm. but I think the products have been well received where it's building up a fan base. And I think that in itself will be what, you know, the company will create more readers for the books regardless of when those books hit so that I, there is a swell there is a swelling of this awa fan base that starts tipping over and buying the the uh the other the other books uh maybe even retroactively and that same that same thing was happening with valiant when warren was over there yeah. which i thought was uh, interesting well i hope for the best it's it's a good book real quickly you mentioned i don't know if you could say anything here but you do have some other projects coming up with marvel or dc in addition in the new year as well yeah, I can't. I can't say anything, but yes, of course. Okay. I mean, I'm always, I'm always, I'm always, I'm always doing a cover or two. Uh, it's really fun for me to, um, especially lately, I've been doing these airbrush covers, which have been really fun. It's fun for me to take a break from the grind of panel to panel and focus on a single image cover for two or three days, 
And um, it's been really fun lately to break up the airbrush and paint on paper with paint and brushes and an airbrush and pencil crayons and ink and um, make my, make my studio messy and dirty. And, you know, that's been tons of fun. And I, I just, you know, I like, I like, I like it. So it's, yeah, I, I'm, I'm constantly doing a little bit of everything. No, I, I like, I, um, it, this is going to sound like a very silly thing, but one of the, the things about your view that that's always uh, I remember is when you did iron fist, uh, for Marvel, you were doing things to the paper texture in mm-hmm. the book that I, again, I, I hadn't seen before, certainly for a, a main Marvel book. And it just, I, I think I was the only person I remember at that point, I'm in the shop and I'm telling people who are coming in, I'm like, check this out. Look at this page. It's incredible. Look what he's doing here. And it was just, it was so new and so different. I, I, I appreciate that kind of stuff. It's, it's a little things, but it's, I think- a, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse to be obsessed with, uh, with, uh, <laughs> doing the new, doing the new. Well, let me tell you, when I first started doing covers for Marvel, I was one of the first digital painters in the, in the, in the industry. And at the time, it was very unique. And, you know, I was one of a handful of people that, that were doing it. And now everyone's doing it. And I've now found that same energy in doing an 80s airbrush style approach to a cover. Like, you know, I just constantly, I just want to zig if, if while the world is zagging, for better or for worse. That's, that's what gets me going. Like, when I'm doing something that other people aren't doing, I get really excited yeah. and it doesn't always work. Uh, <laughs> but that's for, that's the, that's the engine that, that makes my art. So what, what I just, I just go with it. Uh, I think it's great stuff. Um, the, the work product's great. I hope people check out erratic. Um, anything, anything else I missed here? Uh, well, first, I just want to, I just want to talk about your videos quickly. Because oh, sure. Sure. Here's what I, here's what I like. Here's what I love about your videos. I'm, I'm, I'm in just a ton, a ton of YouTube while I work right these days used to there was a time when it was all dvd commentaries um but they don't even make dvds anymore so that's gone away but i loved if i'm drawing art i want to stimulate my mind so whether it's a stanford talk or whether it's a whatever or or a perch video or i just want to have my ideas activated in my brain to keep me drawing and uh, i really like a lot of your videos where you take a um first principles uh, deconstruction of whatever topic you're talking about. And it's fun that it's a comic book topic. There's like, you know, when I was growing up, there was Wizard Magazine. That's no longer around, but what is there now? Well, there's your videos, there's cartoonist uh, kayfabe, there's like, there's some there's some real internet comic book f- uh, fandom that is, that is, I think, growing and swelling and like, and brewing. And it's, it's fun to have that. And I, and I, I do, I like, I like how you, touch on some creative stuff some just commentary some s- industry stuff some store stuff whatever I, I, I really it's a lot of fun to listen to you uh, kind of like you know talk, <laughs> talk 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 shop even even if i think it's because probably you're not um uh, actively writing or drawing a, a book at, at a major two company right now like it's fun to get a, a critical analysis from your perspective, and I can, I can kind of guess what you know. I could, I gathered kind of what that might be, but it's it's really fun to hear that analysis from from someone's mind. So, yeah, it's been fun. Well, thank you. I, I take compliments terribly, but that's, <laughs> thank you for that. I'm glad you listen. I, I see people pop up from time to time. You you popped up, and it was uh, you're you're one of those people that I've followed for years. So it's, it's always this magical surprise. That, yeah, well, it's hard to it's hard to pop up because uh, everything's so controversial. True. Just putting your name to someone's video can be like, you know, set uh, unleash the banshees or whatever, or the 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 the, 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 sure. the dragons or, or whatever. So, uh, you know, I watch tons of stuff that uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to comment on, but 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 uh, but you know, it, 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 some of your videos are 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 are, are pretty uh, team controversial wise they're just intellectually stimulating so if i run across those maybe yeah i think i've commented on two or two or three just to yeah a little hey that was cool or whatever i appreciate that I, yeah i try it's hard to it's hard to navigate this whole space right now and stay out of the controversy because on one hand you know you want to comment on it you want to deconstruct it you want to talk about hey why did this happen how did this go uh, but it's easy then to tip into the war and where suddenly you're you know you're not just commenting on it, now you're you picked a side and yeah uh, that call to battle, man, is strong. Like that's what uh, the social media just calls you to battle. And I, it's hard to resist sometimes because you want, you have something to say, right. But it's like, I think the <laughs> discipline that you, 
learn is is you don't have to say things. You don't have to always jump, have to jump in with a sword. You know, sometimes you can just let it play out and focus on yourself. Maybe that's the lesson of social media. Ultimately, will be that we need to focus more on what ourselves and what we are doing, not what the world out sound is screaming at us through the social medias. I don't know. That'd be a good lesson for people to learn. I you know, so. But it's like that when I get stuck, when I get stuck in art, it's always like I get jammed up in my, what, what I'm worried, how I'm worried something will be received. And that's the social media jam. And the, the, the fix is always, Oh, just go back and just focus on the process and the focus on the process of whatever you're doing, the art making, mm -hmm. uh, either changing media or just, or just trying to do better or make folks on anatomy or composition or do another layout or what, like if you can focus on the process and get out of that trap of false expectations, that ultimately gets, you, your work gets better. And then, and, and you know what those experts, those people appreciate the results more. If you can get out of focusing on the results, strangely you'll get better results it's so I, maybe there's a lesson there for social media like if you know if you can resist the call to the public war and just focus on what you're doing maybe that actually will win the war yeah i i hope i hope it can cut, turn around i i'm look uh so the comic erratic out wednesday kari andrews thank you very very much um for all this time and and I just, I, I really appreciate you giving me the time and of day. You're, it's, it's a real honor to speak to somebody like you. It's been a lot of, it's been a lot of fun perch. Thanks. And I'll be, I'll be listening to your videos. So keep, keep them coming.